so my name's Daniel Sitanayake. Um, nice to meet you if I haven't seen you before. And uh, if, I, if I have, thanks for tuning in again. So we'd like to, first of all, thank our Tiny ML Talks sponsors. So um, first up, there's Edge Impulse, which I'm a, a big fan of. You can see this is the company I work for. Um, we then have Maxim Integrated and Sinsense, and we have messages from some of those sponsors later on. So if you're interested in sponsoring Tiny ML Talks, we'd be really excited to hear from you. And you can contact Betty at tinyml.org for info. So our next Tiny ML Talk is coming up on Tuesday, June 23rd. We have these every Tuesday, um, pretty much every Tuesday. And our first presenter, is Umesh Kurup from LG Electronics America Research Lab talking about a weight averaging approach to speeding up model training on resource constrained devices. And our second talk is from Brandon Rumberg at Aspinity talking about analog ML and how analog ML is relevant because most sensor content isn't. So that's gonna be same time next week. And if you are interested in presenting at a future talk, just let us know via talks at tinyml.org. Um, up next, we have a talk from John Tapson at Gray Matter Labs. And the talk is titled, Saving 95% of your edge power with sparsity to enable TinyML. Jonathan Tapson is the Chief Scientific Op Officer of Gray Matter Labs. Prior to this, he was the Director of the Marx Institute for Brain, Behavior and Development at the University of Western Sydney and has held positions at Dean and Head of Department levels in multiple universities. His research covers neuromorphic engineering and bio-inspired sensors, and he's authored over 160 papers and a dozen patents. So, John, I will uh, hand it over to you. Thank you, Daniel. Can you folks hear me all right? Daniel, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Good. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody and uh, thanks for taking time to come to our talks and, and also thanks to our hosts at uh, Tiny ML who have been uh, reorganized and professional, uh, which is wonderful. So my talk today is basically gonna uh, describe how we can save a great deal of power at the edge. But, and I think for this community, that's, um, that's uh, of uh, central interest. And uh, I will describe how we've uh, built a new architecture that um, takes advantage of these possibilities. Just to tell you a little about our company, um, it's a startup uh, headquartered out of Silicon Valley, San Jose. We have technical teams in uh, Paris, which is where the original uh, university work was done on this, on this uh, technology, and in Eindhoven. Uh, and I think many of you know that the, that's a a silicon design uh, powerhouse because of the legacy from the Philips and uh, subsequently NXP company um, headquartered there. Okay, so I think the central message of my talk today is basically going to be to persuade you that edge workloads are intrinsically different than data center workloads. And because of that, we there are a great many um, opportunities for us to save power and energy, which one doesn't necessarily have in a data center uh, situation. And, and I, I'm contrasting with the data center because so much of machine learning comes from the kind of data center environment. So, you know, um, there's an assumption that the tasks and the hardware and the kind of thinking um, are uh, relate to data center tasks. Edge workloads are different. One of the keys to them is that these are real-time processes. You don't, you don't necessarily have the luxury of batching uh, or, or um, uh, controlling the flow of information. So we, we, what we have are smart devices which are responding to input and we want rapid device, uh, we want rapid feedback from, from our smart devices. When, when you talk to Siri or, or uh, your Google Home device, every millisecond of lag reduces your user experience. And, and I think you also, will have noticed this, for example, in predictive text from your phone. All of those lags add up to a, to a reduced experience. Similarly, in the industrial environment or in uh, autonomous driving or in drones, we have these very closely coupled feedback loops where speed is critical and the latency of, of, of uh, machine learning is critical. So, so these are different kind of processes. A second feature is that input data streams tend to be continuous. And, and so 
if you think about a, an edge video feed, perhaps from a smart doorbell, it's not, there are no cuts in, it's not a movie and it's not actually a, a set of uh, unrelated pictures such as a Facebook feed. A Facebook feed has a sunset and a party and it's a, it's a succession of unrelated images where, whereas a, a smart doorbell video feed is absolutely continuous with very little change from, from time to time. Similarly with uh, audio feeds to, to smart devices or industrial uh, sensor, sensor ensembles. Or for example, in a lot of the biosignal mon monitoring that happens at the edge, your, your, your ECG is supposed to be continuous. If it isn't, uh, you know, that's a different issue, but, but in principle, it's a, it's a continuous data feed. The second feature of edge data is that we're sampling a massive amount of data to get a very small amount of information. And if I can give you an example from, from uh, home, uh, uh, smart home assistants, most of them have microphone arrays, two to seven microphones, and they're sampling at 16 kilo samples per second, 16 bits. So you've got, you've, you've got a data rate that's mega, measured in megabits per second, but speech, which is all that, that, that uh, these devices want to pick up, the classic information rate of speech is about 39 bits per second, and, and that's universal across languages, across demographics, across cultures. So we're, we're sampling megabits in order to establish bits per second of information. Smart, smart doorbells are, are, are similar. You've got a 79 megabit per second video feed um, from a, a typical um, UXGA video, but the information there is extraordinarily small and it's actually effectively zero. It's not, it's not quite zero, one, one can argue it, but if there's nobody standing in front of the doorbell, the information is minimal. So, so massive reduction in dimensionality from the, from the data to the information. And something else is that, thinking again about speech, this is an example of, of a speech waveform when the speaker is talking, and you can see that there's a lot of dead periods. There's a lot of downtime right in the middle of the, of, of the voice signal. So, and, and the amount of time, uh, even in a busy household, when, when there's actual speech to, to sense is quite small. So most of these inputs have, have very high levels of of, of redundancy. And, and, and here's an example from a, from a doorbell camera. Um, it's a very, very busy frame, a lot of stuff happening there. But if you look at the difference between any two successive frames of this, of this video, you see that, that even in this very busy scene, not a lot is changing. I mean, there's a, there's a cyclist riding through the middle of the scene and that's it. And, and the number of bits or pixels that change in the image is very small. It's, it, it's sub 10% depending on, on how optically noisy the situation is and how you threshold things. So a second feature which people don't actually obviously don't often think about, the bits that are changing in this image are not scattered all over the place. They're actually highly localized. They're around the cyclist. If you, if you look carefully, you can see in the background, there's a lot of optical noise, if you like, going on. So you, but, but fundamentally, the changes are, are, are highly localized in space and time. And, and this is actually an opportunity for us to exploit in our processing. So we talk a lot about sparsity. This is a type of sparsity and, and, and sparsity has come to have a specific meaning in the machine learning um, community, which is actually the third, third uh, down in this table, which is sparsity and connectivity. The idea that we can sparsify the connections in a neural network in order to reduce its size. And, and um, Yung Shang spoke about this in terms of pruning networks, but that's only one kind of um, sparsity that we can exploit. The first kind of sparsity is, is actually just sparsity in space. Uh, and basically, as, we, as our input systems get larger and larger in their dimensions, we go from VGA to, to HD to 4K to 8K images, the information in, in, the, in the image doesn't actually change. Um, so, we, so the information gets sparser and sparser as, as the dimensions of the, of the um, input space get larger and larger. The second thing is that real world uh, information is pretty sparse in time. In the real world, stuff happens at human speed. It doesn't happen at kilo samples per second speed. So, and, and quite often as we pointed out, there's not much happening at all in, in an edge data feed. If you think about a security camera looking at a parking lot, if nobody's driving in or out of the parking lot, nothing's happening, there's no information. So, so information is sparse in time. 
We also have sparsity in, in, in connectivity. Um, so we spoke about that and I'm not gonna go into it much because Young Shang covered it pretty well. But finally, within a network, we can have sparsity and activation. So, so you're familiar with, for example, ReLU neurons, um, which basically output zero if, if the sum of their inputs uh, is less than zero uh, in, in, a, in a typical use, usage. And, and we, we see the figures that, that, for example, typically less than 40% of the neurons in the network might be activated by any given um, inference activity. So, so all of the sparsity is going on, and, and, and yet we, we have these situations where when we have uh, deep neural networks and typically CNNs, um, we process every single pixel all the way through every single feature map element to the output for every, everything that changes on the input. So, so the question we at Gray Matter Labs have been asking is, how do you process only the data that changes? And, and uh, that's the key to exploiting sparsity. One of the things to think about is, is that, and, and this is just a kind of cartoon of a, of, of a CNN, any, any pixel that changes fans out. So it's not, it's not completely simple. You, a single pixel change in the input is going to change nine pixels if you're using three by three convolutions in every, in, in every feature map. So there's, there's a degree of fan out of activity that, that um, one has to take into consideration. But there's also fan in. Max pooling is a, is, is a fan in operation. And um, a further thing to think about is that when you, as I pointed out, stuff changes locally in, in, in the input. You know, the cyclist walks, uh, cycles past and only those pixels around the cyclist change from frame to frame. So, so the, this, it's kind of co-localized, if I can put it that way, burst of activity that propagates through the, through the network that we need to deal with rather than large scale distributed um, changes. So we, we exploit this in, in, in fairly obvious kind of ways. And here's, this is just a little cartoon, which um, at the top shows a kind of standard um, uh, CNN where as frames of video come in, the whole frame propagates through the whole network and uh, uh, you process the whole thing. What, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, at some sense, in some sense, there are key frames where you where you take the whole um, you take the whole uh, image in one go. This is a little scary. My my uh, presentation is advancing all by itself. I hope it's going to stop. Yes. Okay. So the the point to to absorb here is that if you're processing just the changes in the scene, you only activate a small amount of your network, and if you propagate only those changes through your network, then you obviously use less energy. It's not completely that simple. And again, I'm grateful to Jung Shang because he made the point that if you're using hardware that multiplies whole matrices, the fact that some of the elements in that matrix may be zero, it's, it's quite hard to actually exploit that. You, as soon as you're going for generalized matrix multiply uh, situations, you're gonna multiply those zeros anyway because it's a whole lot easier than, than taking them out of the, out of the matrix and, and, and compressing the matrix. On, on the other hand, if you do take advantage of the sparsity. Here's a typical indication of the kind of gains that, that you can get. So these are real figures from a, an NVIDIA task called PilotNet. At the top, it's a, it's a, it's a driving data set. So you, you, you look at the scene in front of you and you change the steering wheel angle. And, and what the graph shows is that you'd normally be running about 28 mega ops per second. Uh, it's, it's quite a small, it's quite a small um, network if you were doing full matrix multiply operations. But by taking advantage of sparsity, you can cut that down to an average of 1.7 mega ops per second. And you can see that in fact, sometimes it's zero. If the car's standing still at traffic lights or whatever, there's just not much going on and, and, and not much processing required. So there's a, a real operation, a real opportunity here to save energy. So what we have done at, at Gray Matter Labs is we, we built a, a neural network accelerator that's specifically designed to exploit sparsity by not doing the massive matrix multiplication um, in hardware that uh, many of the GPU type solutions are doing. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, neuro, it's, a, it's, it's literally a neural network. It has uh, 196 um, clusters of neurons and uh, it's set up, you can, you can see from the actual, this is the silicon die layout. You can actually see the, the network structure in there to some extent. So 
This particular chip, which is our first chip and more or less just a, a, a technology demonstrator, has two, 200,000 neurons, which isn't obviously a lot, but um, it can, we can run some useful networks and, and obviously uh, we're, we're scaling up from here. So the way it works is that you have uh, this block diagram of, of, of the chip. You have general purpose um, IO that can pass uh, events into the system. And then the events, uh, the inputs get routed around in the form of packets to a bunch of neuron cores, which then perform the, the, the computation. And, and each neuron core has about a thousand neurons. Um, uh, so in a, in a kind of neuron cluster, if I can put it that way. What happens in each neuron is shown in this cartoon. You've got events and we think of them as events. We, we think of one pixel changing as being an event and we treat it as a unique little um, snowflake of a, of, a, of, a, of a data change that, that, that is taken uh, through the entire system. So those events come through on the network on chip, they get queued in, a, in, in an event queue. And then um, as each of them uh, uh, becomes you know, on, on a FIFO basis gets the front of the queue. It gets multiplied by the, the necessary weights to, um, uh, you know, to, to perform the uh, in, inference. And then we update the state of, of, of any neuron that's processing that, that event. And then we send out the, um, through various uh, axons, we, 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 we send, we use the kind of biological terminology. We send those events back out onto the network. So that's, it's very much an event by event um, hardware rather than a, than a matrix um, manipulating hardware. So we have built these chips. We got them back in, in January and we've been um, developing some use cases around them uh, uh, during that time. This, this picture uh, in the middle here shows a, shows a self-driving um, an ADAS simulation. So we've got a video camera that's looking at a road scene uh, on a screen. So we're playing a driving video to, to a camera and then the camera sends those, those frames to um, our gray one chip, which is on the circuit board here, which then outputs a, a steering wheel angle. And it does this with, with incredibly low latency. I mean, it, it's kind of a little crazy because the video frame rate is 30 frames per second, but the speed of processing is, is of the order of microseconds. It's about 20 microseconds. So most of the time the chip is just sitting and doing not very much at all. So how do you actually talk to this? The problem with these unique architectures is they can be very, very difficult to program. So we, we've taken the trouble to build a full software stack for this, where, where you, you know, starting from the application level, we can define um, code in terms of TensorFlow, obviously not the 100% exhaustive TensorFlow um, uh, coverage, but, but you know, very much an 80-20 principle where we've, we've implemented the 20% of TensorFlow that covers 80% of models quite, quite comfortably. And, and so it's possible to, to write your, write your um, network in TensorFlow and, and uh, not have to worry too much about what happens in the layers below that. But, but we can also just write it directly in Python or C++ if we, if we want to do something a little unusual. What happens then is that the, the um, the networks get translated down through our API. And, and this is kind of the key feature here. It's the mapper which says, okay, how do I translate pixels to neurons to um, inference on this, on this neural network fabric? So this mapper basically decides, optimizes how, how to um, feed that uh, activity through the, through the neural network and get the, uh, get the correct inference. And what you, what you see is uh, we do a lot of simulation because it's possible to optimize that process quite uh, substantially without trying it on, on, on hardware first. And then we can generate the code that actually, that you know, generate the actual microcode that's gonna run on the, on the chip and, and, and um, compile that down. And then there's obviously the usual runtime support, debugging support that you would expect from a, from a standard system. And we've implemented some, uh, some fairly uh, uh, standard networks. This is, NVIDIA has a small self-driving network called PilotNet, which is one that we focused on quite a lot. And uh, this is typical performance of the chip. So we're getting about, and, and, and this, is, this is to some extent task dependent, but we, we, we get a, um, about five mega ops per second. But uh, uh, if, if you were just running native TensorFlow, you'd be needing five mega ops per second, but because it's sparsified, 
you're getting about 0.6 mega ops per second and, and, and it enables us to actually run this stuff through the through the network at over 3000 frames per second as i was saying it we well because it's a distributed uh, a distributed computation taking place in multiple cores effectively um uh, 196 cores you get incredibly fast propagation of, of the network through the through the system so that's where we are at the moment um, if it, um, just to kind of summarize what we're trying to do is is what we call it live AI because we're trying to uh, operate on these on these real-time data streams which require very short latencies and um, which probably have very high dimensional reduction uh, possibilities we have a processor technology that we've instantiated on silicon that, that exploits the sparsity and the current form of it is as, a, as an accelerator. And we have a, a software development kit that's able to actually um, program that chip and get the uh, inferences working on the, on, on the silicon fabric. So that's where we are today. And yeah, I was going to stop for questions, but I guess I just got in a flow. So thank you very much. And uh, Daniel, I'm... I'm and take questions now thank you so thank you john that was fascinating and um we have a few questions and please please continue to add your questions to the q a tool um while while we answer them but uh so our first question is a uh, lot of applications classically require some type of pre-processing for example fft's before data is input to a neural network can your hardware account for this type of pre-processing yeah that's that's a great question because we can um so, so each neuron is effectively like a little CPU, or, or, or if you like a risk, a risk CPU, a reduced instruction set CPU. It has about, I think at last count, 31 instructions, and, and the typical CPU instructions like multiply or shift left or shift right, as well as neural functions uh, like activation functions. So we, we have done a, um, a speech recognition system in which we did the full DSP front end, we did the FFT, uh, we did beam forming from uh, from a couple of microphones, and then we did, uh, by means of FFT, and then we did the um, scale transformation from FFT bands to null frequency NFCC co coefficients, and then passed that down to to an inference engine. And and um, it's kind of cool that you can do DSP on on, on this fabric, and and it, because it's massively parallel, it's it's pretty fast DSP. We're we're, we're kind of uh, very happy with that functionality, and that that's why. You may have noticed in the SDK slide, there is a C++ compilation option because, because if you want to do DSP, then, then you're going to want to write it probably in C++. Okay, fantastic. Um, so next question is, how do you deal with recurrent connections and also exploit into frame sparsity in the architecture? Yeah, that, that, that's again, you, you're getting to the core of what we're trying to do. Um, re recurrent connections are not uh, conceptually difficult because you, you, the mapper can route any connection to any connection, so um, there's there's no need to kind of layer the layer the network in in, in, a, in a CNN kind of way. You could have absolutely random connections forward and backward if you wanted. The problem with uh, RNNs, as as anybody who's done RNN hardware knows, is is that you need a lot of dynamic range um, to accommodate the fact that you're accumulating sometimes very large. Uh, signals on, on particular neurons. So we've, we've implemented, um, so the chip that I, I, I just described uh, does not have this, but the, the chip that we're building at the moment will have BFLOAT 16 re representation to give us the dynamic range for, for RNNs. So I mean, long story short, we can implement RNNs on the current chip. They tend to saturate pretty easily. The next chip will have uh, numerical representation to pre prevent saturation. And the, the second part of that question is, how do you, how do you maintain, uh, if I interpret correctly, how do you maintain state so as to take advantage of the um, of, of frame to frame uh, correlated information? And the answer there is, is you, you have to have some kind of memory, just as an RNN is in a sense of memory. So, and, and we actually maintain state at the neuron. We save, we save the state of the neuron between frames so that we're able to compare how should the, you know, what did the neuron do in the last frame? What is it doing in the current frame? And, and, and that gives us the advantage of, um, of having persistence in time of, of, of signals, which I think was the question. Uh, I hope I interpreted that right. Fantastic, thank you. So next up, um, how does the chip 
calculate the pixels that have changed between yep. one event and the next? And how does that compute overhead compare to regular operation? Yeah, it's a really good question. That so, so we the, the kind of first element in the whole chain is is, is a um, we call it the frame to event converter, which basically is is calculating the delta um, frames. We we call them delta frames, which is the same language as video compression. And video compression, they talk about a keyframe, which is where you save the whole frame, and a delta frame where you save only the changes. And we might as well use the same language. So, so computation of the delta frame is a little bit expensive in terms of um, of memory and uh, and computation, but the memory is on chip. And and those of you who are hardware people know that the cost of memory kind of goes up exponentially as the memory gets further and further away in the computation engine. We're doing that computation right effectively in memory. So, um, I mean, it, it's semantics whether it's in memory or very, very, very near memory. So the, the memory cost, the, the power cost or energetic cost of, of, of that computation is low. The silicon cost is high because you've got to have a lot of memory right right there in the, in, in the chip. And, and we, we believe that we've optimized that pretty well. Okay, fantastic. So next question, um, does it mean the mapper and the code gen need to run for each frame of input data? No, no, no. So, so that runs at compile time and then, and then after that um, it's mapped and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's compiled once run forever. Perfect. Um, is the gray chip available for purchase? Okay, so it, it's, it's not available for purchase, but it's available for sampling, if I can put it that way. If you, if you contact us, we'd be super happy if people are interested in using it to, to make something available. But, but because it's a, it's a technology demonstrator chip, we're, we're unlikely to actually sell it. We are happy to make it available to potential customers. And then obviously our next chip will be a, um, a commercial chip. Well, and what's the best way to contact you if someone is interested? In That's stuff? a really good question. So, so um, the company name is Gray Matter Labs, and uh, it was on the first slide, and the slides will be will be sent out. And um, so, I think if you go to our website, you'll you'll be able to find a, a contact address there, or through the Tiny ML organizers. If you guys are willing to pass my email address on, I'm super happy for you to to give out my email address. That would be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so in one of the slides you showed, there was an FPGA attached to your hardware. What is it used for? Yes. Okay, so the first chip being a proof of concept is just, a, is just an accelerator chip. And so it needs a host and the FPGA is hosting it and doing, for example, the um, MIPI interface to the, um, to the video camera, which we didn't put on, on our native silicon. Our next silicon will, will have an ARM core on it to do the hosting. So, so that's, that's what the FPGA is doing is basically feeding and, and nurturing the accelerated chip, giving it the data and, and, and getting the results back again. And the uh, final question here, could this be used with a neuromorphic image sensor like the one from Prophecy? Yeah, you know, we, we, we love those sensors and, and, and our architecture is a, is a really nice match for them. Um, and in fact, you know, it's kind of much, there's much less friction in going from a a, a dynamic vision sensor like the prophecy sensors straight to our chip because you've already got your information in the form of events. So the, the trans transition is much more um, seamless. Uh, our real, um, in fact, our only thing I can say about those is I wish people would get on and, and adopt those cameras more widely because they're fantastic cameras and, and, and the data is much, uh, is much, uh, um, uh, easier to use uh, than regular video frames, but but the adoption is not high yet. So so we 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 built we we built in the um, the interfaces for regular video. Okay, fantastic. So thank you so much, John. This is a, a great presentation, and um, so thanks again to our Tiny ML Talk sponsors. So those are Edge Impulse. Maxim Integrated and Sinsense. If you're interested in sponsoring this talk series, please contact Betty at tinyml.org for information. Thank you also to Zoom for slowing down my slide advance. Um, okay, so a little bit of information about some of our sponsors. So Edge Impulse, I'm a little biased, but I think we're the easiest way to train a model for inference at the edge 
and in fact, probably in general. Um, we have a, an awesome interface you can use to connect an embedded device, collect data, train a model, evaluate your model and deploy it back down to a, a bunch of different targets using the optimizations that are available for each target. So um, you should definitely check out Edge Impulse if you'd like to rapidly train models and, and deploy to Edge devices. And our sponsor, SynSense, formerly known as AICTX, builds ultra low power sub milliwatt sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. So they design systems for real time, always on smart sensing for audio, vision, bio signals, and more. And you can learn more about SynSense at AICTX.ai. So our next talk, um, as I mentioned earlier, from Unmesh Kuru uh, at LG Electronics America is a weight averaging approach to speeding up model training on resource constrained devices. And our uh, subsequent talk from Brandon Rumberg, which is analog ML is relevant because most sensor content isn't. Uh, so that's on Tuesday, June 23rd, next Thursday, next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, same time as this one. So please um, come along. And you can contact talks at tinyml.org if you would like to present yourself. So I just wanted to thank everybody again for attending. Thank you, huge thanks to our two excellent speakers today. And thanks to the whole tinyml.org crew for organizing another successful talk. Looking forward to the next one. <laughs>